Hello, my name is Torb. I love gear. This video is going to be a little different for me. I'm talking about a vinyl DJ set, not synthesizers, uh, not keyboards at all. But in general, what I'm trying to do is show you everything that uh, I went through the first time I did a vinyl DJ set, what didn't, didn't work for me, things I learned, things that I won't do again. Uh, you know, maybe put things together a little bit clearer, jump you forward in learning about it, things like that. So there'll be this video where I talk about everything that happened that won't have any music in it, and I will have monetization on for this. Uh, there'll be a separate video that is just my first run through of the set, uh, mistakes and all. So I think it's important to see that that totally happens. And the first time you run through something, it probably won't be perfect, and that's okay. Uh, but that will not be monetized, so I can play all the copyright music. And I, uh, I'll put all the songs that are available on Spotify and Spotify playlist if you guys care to listen to that. I don't know if this content is going to be super interesting to most of my normal subs. I don't know if new people are just going to find it. I don't know if this is going to get launched into the internet and just sit there for a while. <laughs> and maybe someday somebody will find it and it'll help them. But uh, at any rate, my hope is that somebody will learn something from this or somebody will get entertainment out of this. Even if you watch this intro and then go watch the set, I appreciate that. I don't care if you jump around. I'm not offended by that. So, in general, how this happened. I had been talking about it for a while. And there's a bar around us that has vinyl DJ sets once in a while. And I really, really like to go there. And I really like to see that. And I realized that I have enough cool records. I could probably do this if I tried. And my roommate had an LP120. And I had another turntable, which I sold. And then found somebody selling an LP120 and a Roland DJ99, I think. It's like a Roland 909 branded DJ mixer. All analog, no effects or anything. Because uh, I was like, yeah, maybe I can practice, maybe I can try this. And that was a while ago, uh, but the opportunity to play this set came up. A good friend of mine was putting on a house show to celebrate 100 episodes of his podcast. Congratulations to Pretty Fort. So I was sort of the after party or the second act for this house show. And the first band was an emo band uh, who played for played an EP of theirs, and they did a wonderful job. And then everybody came upstairs to uh, Funk and Disco by Jorb. <laughs> So I already had all these records. I didn't buy anything just for this. Uh, I had bought the turntable and the mixer in expectation that maybe I can get into this. I, I got a pretty good deal on them together. I don't remember what it was, but I'll put a screenshot of the eBay listing. Nobody else had made an offer, but it was, it was packed really poorly when I got it. But it works fine, and I only had to clean up a few things. And I think I had to like bend one of the faders back in position. But it works for what I was trying to do. Uh, but the way I decided what songs to do, I sat at my record shelf. And I stepped through everything that I thought would be fun or danceable. So I made this one big Spotify playlist of all the albums I had that I thought would be fun or funky. Uh, and then actually on the road to KnobCon, we listened to that playlist straight through uh, and I skipped anything I didn't think would be fun or danceable or however you want to think of it. And then the songs that I decided, okay, this can work in a set, went into their own Spotify playlist. And then from there, I listened to that and cut it down to my set time. Originally, I was going to have 45 minutes, but I ended up playing for two hours. <laughs> but I planned uh, about 140 minutes uh, worth of music, just in case. You never know. If people are dancing. What am I going to do? Stop them from dancing? <laughs> in general, the way I did this set, there wasn't a ton of time pressure. If you aren't familiar with this at all, in general, what a DJ mixer lets you do is, one, fade between these two records, but also manipulate their levels, manipulate their EQ, and really, really importantly, you get this submix, they call it a cue, to your headphones. And on my DJ mixer, there's a switch on the front to decide what your headphones are listening to. You're either listening to just the cue, the cue on one side, and the mix on the other, or just the master out mix. And I was playing with that a lot and playing with the cue in general, but the idea with that is you can listen to a record that the audience is not listening to. So while one record was playing, I would track to the middle of whatever song I was about to play and let it go and listen to the master mix on one side and the cue on the other and just cue the record nobody was hearing and line up my levels. And so once my levels are lined up, okay, good. I make sure the EQ makes sense. And then I stop that record pull back to the beginning, and then try and count. And if I count one measure or two measures before, so I know how long my fade between them is going to be, or I'm going to fade out on the left record for a measure, and then fade into the right record for a measure, things like that, get my timing right, and rolling the record back, so that when I hit start, it was the right amount of time before any noise happened. Or if I wanted to skip part of the song, or I was coming through halfway in the middle, lining that all up. That doesn't take the whole length of the other songs. You don't have a lot of time pressure. You can you can get it right. You start one record, and while that record is playing, you have enough time to put away the last one, take out the next one, find the right track, listen to it for a little bit, match your levels, change your speed if you want to change your speed, which I didn't do very much of, and then line it up to the beginning. 
So you really get, you know, three and a half, four or five minutes to do tasks that don't take you that long. So maybe I'd brush off a record in between, all these little things. Uh, but then you're just kind of waiting and lining stuff up and making sure everything else is staying steady, uh, which was kind of different for me because I'm used to playing instruments live. I did a couple little tricks. I won't play any of it just to risk copyright strike because I can't lose my YouTube channel. <laughs> but early on in the set, I play um, two songs off the same Art of Noise record. I do maybe the first half or three quarters of uh, Paranormia, Paranormia, Paranormia. I think it's Paranormia. And then I fade to a sort of calibrate your turntables record and it says something along the lines of you've tested it with noise now let's hear it with music and i have like 15 ish seconds maybe 20 seconds to grab the tone arm and skip to another song on that arv noise record now that you have an idea of how your cartridge performs with test material let's see how it performs with music I did that because I wanted to do some tricky little maneuvers. <laughs> I wanted to get myself mixing between stuff because I want to practice that stuff. And doing it under pressure and doing it quickly can help me get used to doing it when I don't have a lot of time pressure. And I did that a few other times. I faded from a disco version of Flight of the Bumblebees into Flight of the Bumblebees, which I don't think was in my warm-up. I played like a minute and a half of a Star Wars disco cover and then faded into something else. I had a couple other... Mostly because, again, I wanted to maneuver these things in a way that was fun for me and fun and interesting for me. Uh, and during my first practice run through, I was fitting everything uh, into a spreadsheet. And the spreadsheet had which record it was on if there were multiple in a single sleeve and which track it was on and which side. It would be this artist, this record, uh, A for side one, B for side two, C and D, and then three. So I like, okay, this is Chaka Khan, the dance remixes. Uh, A4. As soon as I get it out, okay, side one, the fourth groove, and I can find that pretty quickly without without having to read the sleeve or check the label. I can, on my phone, look at my spreadsheet here, uh, and then all I need to see is side one or, or side A, whichever, and then line up with the fourth set of grooves. Perfect. And having the set times in there and like this running uh, total of how long it was going to be, uh, in case somebody said, hey, you only have 15 minutes left, I could look at what was left and pick out the songs I really wanted to hit or make a comfortable arc for the last 15 minutes, even though that didn't happen. I ended up just playing longer than my allotted time and ending when I felt like it was time to end. Some of the things in general uh, that I learned, I was really focused on the crossfader, especially for my first run through. And then when I actually performed, I was using the big individual track levels uh, a lot more and fading one track out completely, letting it sit for a sec People kind of nod their heads at each other, you know, then they have the expectation of something new and you can fade into another song. Or if it has a really cool, abrupt beginning, you get to have that moment and you don't fade into the middle of the song. You get that. Here's a new song. This is what you're going to be listening to for a second. Uh, as much fun as it is to very carefully fade between two tracks, you don't have to do that every time. And in, in fact, it's probably better if you don't do that every time. Uh, I thought I would be matching times up more than I did. Um, but because also I wasn't fading directly between tracks in the actual set as much as I expected to, that didn't end up being the case. Uh, and I found that overcomplicating the headphone situation was not good. So for the most part, I left the headphones pointed to the EQ, the submix, and I would just click the buttons on top to alternate which record was getting sent to the queue. It was easier for me to see, oh, there's lights on top, I'm listening to the left record, I'm listening to the right record. Uh, I want to listen both together, things like that. It was easy to mix that. Uh, and I liked having the stereo mix in my headphones that everybody else was about to hear as well. Uh, I had to calibrate my turntables a lot in advance of this. I had to turn up the tracking for us a little bit when we were actually on the floor uh, and dial in anti-skate a little better than we were. We mock danced <laughs> while I was setting up. Uh, we jumped around a little bit to see if we could get the needles to skip and we certainly did i actually ended up cutting a few records the day of because they were skipping i was just on a card table <laughs> things were propped up with cardboard um i there, there's a few records i was going to play that i changed my mind about uh, if they skipped at all i didn't want to risk that when people are trying to dance so i took those out of the set i get that most people probably don't have enough records to just whip out two hours of you know, not repeating songs on eight tracks, especially ones that are all going to be funky. I've just been buying records like that uh, really all through college. So it's really f five or six years of buying records that I thought were cool and 
just wanted to listen to myself, not necessarily that I had a plan to do this. I know that's not the situation for most people. I also know that most people don't just preemptively buy a DJ mixer because they think they might be interested in it. <laughs> you know, we mix between records at a couple parties and when we're doing dinners or whatever, but I didn't need to buy that DJ <laughs> mixer when I did. Uh, I just happened to have it. I know that's not the case for most people. So even if you're using CDJs or IDJs or whatever they call them, I don't actually know. <laughs> uh, I think the idea of starting with a playlist and refining can be relevant to a lot of people. Uh, I hope that the tidbit about I was too focused on the crossfader when I could have been doing other things and the idea that a little bit of space between songs is not just fine, it's a good idea in a lot of cases. Things that I was just like, not until I had ran through it once, was like, ah, you know what? That makes a lot of sense. So I hope those little nuggets are, are useful to people. But there you go. I talked for a while. I'm going to splice it up into something coherent. Um, really appreciate you watching. I hope this was helpful to you. I really hope you guys check out the other video I did because it's unmonetized. <laughs> so that's how you know it's literally just for you guys. It's not for me at all. So maybe I'll link my merch below that. But pop on the Spotify playlist if uh, you don't care to watch a video or want to listen to it in the car. It's mostly just music that I think is cool and want people to know is cool. I hope there's some songs you hadn't heard of and maybe some you had. But I had a lot of fun. I'd love to work out another set. I'd love to do it again. I think I could do... I don't think I could do none of the same songs and still get two hours. But I, I have enough alternates <laughs> that I might have another set. I might have a different enough set to work out. So yeah, maybe you'll see a couple more unmonetized sets while I practice stuff or make decisions. I'm definitely going to try and get a set at that bar we really like. So Anyway, there you go. My name's Jorb. I love gear. Uh, do I get to say I love gear for this? I love music. I really enjoy DJing <laughs> or the Spotify playlist if you guys want to put it on the car or whatever. So anyway, really appreciate you watching. My name's Jorb. I love gear. I love music. <laughs> Hope to see you in the next one. Cheers.